Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about was one of my experiences with Wixa, and that is some of the things they do to sort of mitigate, I think, those challenges that we face with, that community college students face when they're studying abroad. And the first thing they do is they partnered with an organization called the American Institute for Study Abroad, or AIFS. And AIFS has um, facilities in about 20 different countries, including in Florence, where they have a school that's literally in the heart of the city center. And uh, this was the school. These are some of my students kind of goofing around. But we got to go up about three floors in this kind of rickety old building. And, uh, and remember, when we talk about old in Florence, we're talking about you know, the 1700s, 1600s. Old in the United States is anything before you were born. And so that was sort of the, you know, the experience that these students had. And they got to walk through these sort of cobblestone alleys. This is the, the alley that kind of led into the school area. Um, and another kind of a, um, a alternate view of this. And um, what's really nice about uh, the AIFS uh, program is they set up these facilities right in the heart of the city. Um, and typically with the AIFS program that's in Florence, taught a lot of two-year programs. So while we were there, we were interacting with all different other kinds of two-year programs. And the thing I really appreciated about this is rather than go to a college where you're in a dorm, you leave your dorm, go to the classroom, go to the cafeteria, these students were actually having to you know, immerse themselves in the community, interact with the community to get from you know, their apartment to um, the classroom. Um, so the school had working computer lab, Wi-Fi, PowerPoint, all the things that were necessary. If students needed access to tutoring, they could get it by going on Wi-Fi and going back to their home institutions. They had a coordinator at each one of their home institutions that was following up with them all the time. So really creating that infrastructure that's so necessary for the two-year student kind of feels like, where am I going? Why am I here? Um, again, I also had three to five other programs that were kind of running simultaneously. Uh, we had a group from California, about 81 students from California. Uh, we had another group from Florida that was about 110, and we were 18. So we were the smallest program there. But they got to interact with all those other two-year programs, and that really made them feel more like a community. Um, the students were housed in the city center, and we were kind of dispersed all around the city. So again, getting away from sort of this dorm environment and allowing students to kind of integrate themselves into the city. Because again, a lot of students were like, what's Florence? Why am I here? And the minute they got to live in Florence, and here's the thing is that, you know, living with people in an apartment in an area of town where you kind of had to fend for yourself, you couldn't just run to an RA or do all the things that you got to do, you had kind of had to fend for yourselves, and that worked um, for them uh, in a lot of ways. So um, we all got apartments. Um, most of the students shared apartments with two, three, or four other people. I have my own apartment, uh, which apparently was much bigger and more palatial than all the other apartments, so I got a lot of uh, uh, grief for that. I, I, I tend to think it wasn't. but. Um, and this was, uh, again, uh, kind of uh, the uh, guys who were in the program. We all stayed in the same apartment building, so we all had very similar uh, apartments. Um, and what was really nice about this is these were furnished, full kitchens, they had to go shopping, uh, and um, so uh, they had to keep their apartments clean, AIFS checked on their apartments about once every two weeks to make sure they were you know, not you know, destroying them. And uh, uh, one interesting story is I had students in one, uh, a couple of the males who were in one of the um, uh, other apartments complained to the supervisor that their um, uh, um, light was out there, um, one of the lights in the bathroom went out with the light bulb. And uh, they just thought that the supervisors were going to come in every day and fix things without them, you know, because that's what mom and dad do, right? You know? So that was another sort of little epiphany. It's like, wait a minute, I actually have to, you know, go get somebody to fix this. Um, so uh, these pictures are from a potluck I had sort of at the end of the quarter just to kind of for all of us to get together and uh, another funny little story about this, one of the things about living in Florence is you have to learn to do without a lot of American food. And so we'd all decided we were going to fix some American dishes to kind of, you know, give everybody a taste of home and kind of do that. So I decided I was going to make macaroni and cheese because you can't buy macaroni and cheese in Florence. 
So I promised everybody this, I thought I was going to do it, find a great recipe on the internet, and then lo and behold, you cannot find cheddar cheese anywhere in Florence, uh, except one little place that I found on the internet. So I went over there, walked, found it, this back little alley went in where they sold all these sort of imported American foods, and this big wheel of cheddar cheese. I asked for a pound of it, so they gave me a wedge, and I thought that looked kind of small, so I said, oh, give me another pound, give me another pound, and I walked it up paid for it, got back home, and I looked at my receipt and realized that that two pounds of cheddar cheese cost me 34 American dollars. Which, at that point, I was like, all right, I've already done it, but, you know, and so my students got literally liquid gold for their... Um, <laughs> um, so one of the nice things about living in these areas is that as you know, when we had to walk from our apartment to the school, the school was in the center of the city, uh, part, uh, very um, heart of the city center. And for us, the guys who were living in this apartment um, building, um, we had to walk about six or seven blocks to the school. And every day we walked to school, we walked through the Piazza di Santa Croce, which is one of the most famous basilicas in Florence. This is the Basilica of the Santa Croce. And uh, so we had to cut through. Uh, and the uh, interesting thing about Santa, the Basilica is uh, it houses uh, the tombs of uh, Galileo, Michelangelo, and then there are monuments to uh, Dante, and this one's to da this one's to Dante. There are other ones to Machiavelli. Um, so we're actually, literally walking past this every single day. This is the piazza that we would walk through. Some days there were uh, uh, little open air markets. There were people selling all kinds of goods and things. And um, one of the things I noticed, and the thing I think is the beauty of how Wixa and AIFS sort of sets up this program, is that these are students who have no idea what Florence was like, had no idea why they were there, and every day we're walking past this gorgeous church and walking through these piazzas. And I had an assignment in my interpersonal class where they had to write a reflection paper about, it was an emotion, we talked about emotions and they had to write some reflection papers on emotions. And I got a paper from a student, a male student, um, who lived in the same apartment building that I did, and he wrote about his emotion that every day he walked past this church, uh, the Basilica of Santa Croce, he experienced what he called literally overwhelming joy. And he said it was because of the unimaginable beauty. He said, every day when I go to school, I walk past a Subway shop or a McDonald's or my favorite Starbucks, and I don't notice it. But he said, every single day I walk to school, I walk past this, and I can't believe how lucky I am. And I realized at that point, okay, study abroad doesn't have to be about something, right? It doesn't have to be this end result. Like, I've studied all this time to, you know, my Italian or my art history, and now I get to go see it. It can literally be about being there and kind of figuring out what you want to do. And this guy was like, I never thought of beauty in that way, you know? And so that's one of the things that kind of hit me was that I think that we can allow our two-year students who say, gosh, I, I don't know... Why would I go study abroad? Because it's there, right? And you can see so much and kind of make those connections, which I think is really helpful. Um, so there were a few other students that were housed. So for example, the Duomo, which is the, the, the grand you know, cathedral um, that's in the center of uh, Florence that people come you know, for thousands of you know, and, uh, miles to see, will stand in lines that last two hours. And my students were walking past this every single day. Uh, and uh, the baptistry doors. Uh, and and you know, my students would kind of come along and say, gosh, we walked past all of these long lines of people that were there for like two days and had to get into the Duomo. And they were saying, eh, we see it every day. This is, this is my walk to school. Um, the Ponte Vecchio, which is the oldest bridge, crosses the Arno in, uh, in Florence. Uh, I had students who had to walk uh, across this bridge to school because they were on uh, the other side of the Arno. And so every day we're walking across this bridge. You know, and we live in a, in a state of bridges. You know, that none of them look like this. And all the students were just kind of like, wow. Uh, another view of this, uh, which, you know, for my students was that connection. And suddenly, it was like, I'm not just crossing a bridge, I'm crossing the oldest bridge. Um, students also received uh, museum passes. Uh, so when they um, checked in in Florence, they got a museum pass, allowed them to go to the museums for free. So they could go to just about any museum in the city, anytime they wanted. 
Uh, and again, remember, you know, you go to Florence, you've got to try to see everything you can see. And we're there for three months, and you're kind of sitting at home thinking, you know what, I think I'm going to go, you know, see the David again. So that's what we did. We kind of went, and but we got to go into a new line, right? So there's like the season pass line, and everybody else has to wait. We got to flash our little cards and get into a shorter line where we could go in and see the David. Um, so the David's been in the, the Academy, the Gallery of the Academy of Florence since literally 1873. Uh, used to be you couldn't take pictures, now you can. Um, and so you just literally got to take all these pictures um, of this amazing artwork. Uh, in addition, we got to you uh, got complete access to the Uffizi Gallery, which is the largest art gallery in Florence. Um, uh, it's right on the edge of the Arno, um, or the banks of the Arno. Um, and kind of a um, you know, repository for all of this artwork. The interesting thing about art, again, is I've got students who aren't art majors, who have no concept of art, no thought that art mattered. And our running joke was every time we went to a museum, all we saw were hundreds of pictures of the Madonna and Child. And they were all kind of like, ugh, see one more picture of Madonna and Child, you know, and they go crazy. Well, we took the tour of the Uffizi with a great tour guide who helped us understand that these aren't just pictures of the Madonna and Child. That over the millennia that we've been creating this artwork, the, the vision or the, the image of the Virgin Mary has changed it's become more humanist. For example, you can look at uh, um, a painting uh, painted very early in which there's no uh, real, uh, like the Virgin Mary is very androgynous, no sense that she has breasts or curves or anything. And as you move through each of these sort of hundred year periods and look at these pictures, she starts to take on all of these new feminine characteristics and she becomes more humanist. And my students, the light bulbs went off, and it's like no longer are they looking at, you know, 100 pictures of the Madonna and Child. They're looking and saying, oh, I bet this is from this era, and this era, and this era. Such a great experience. So, um, and, you know, the Uffizi Gallery is just, you know, phenomenal. You can spend, you know, days in there and still not see everything. Uh, and then um, we uh, got to go to the, the Pitti Palace, uh, which is the uh, uh, old home of the Medici family. Uh, we got to go to Bargello, which is this old um, uh, prison that was turned into the old city hall, and now it's a museum. Um, and then AIFS set up these kind of other activities that allow students to kind of have a reason to stay in Florence. Because they all wanted to leave. Weekend came, and boy, I'm going to go to Barcelona, and do all these things. So they set up all these great programs, a lot of students to kind of say, gosh, there's a reason for me to stay here. And one of our favorites was these cooking classes. We got to take two cooking classes with this amazing gentleman whose name escapes me, and I've been trying to think all day, and I cannot remember his name. Uh, but he was terrific, and he owns this, and so he brings these groups of students in, and we take these cooking classes. And so what we got to do was make our own um, uh, ricotta and spinach stuffed ravioli. We literally made it from scratch, pressed it, cut it, and you can see uh, we made uh, panna cotta. Uh, we uh, made, and this kind of is out of order, but you can see how they're actually making the ravioli. We rolled it out. You have to roll it like 20 times to get it, you know, where it needs to be. And then we took turns stuffing it, and then they, you know, put the other one over it, pressed it, and cut it. And um, and I'm telling you, take kids out anywhere. And I had this problem with my speech debate students. The minute you sit down to eat, the minute you do anything, pull out those cell phones and text, right? I'm telling you, the minute these um, students started cooking for themselves and started, you know, we made gelato. We made our own from scratch pineapple gelato. Uh, and you'd have thought they, you know, had just gotten one a trip to the moon. They thought it was just the most amazing thing. We made pizza. I mean, you can see, they really had a great time. And we took two of these classes, and this is the, we made asparagus souffle um, with, from scratch, which was, we pureed it and everything. It was, it was wonderful. Um, and then we got to eat our own creations in this amazing, beautiful dining room that was in the basement. Um, and just, it was, it was terrific. Um, and again, like I said, two-year students that get to do this think, oh, I, I can't do this. And this is what it's about. This is about making those connections. Um, so uh, this, I think, was our second. We made our own gelato, and we got to eat that. And uh, so, um, so the cooking classes were terrific. 
Um, the other things that they did was they created, uh, they set up, for example, a couple of opportunities um, for students to do, they did a wine and olive tasting um, little seminar. Um, then they uh, went to a local opera. So it was all these things that were kind of, in, in, you know, um, kind of incentivizing students to want to stay in Florence and get to know that before you're kind of venturing out onto these you know, other travel areas. Um, so the other thing that's really interesting too about the way that Wixa kind of sets this up is, remember we don't have these sort of discipline specific classes. So those of us that get hired to teach Wixa are teaching in our own discipline. I teach communication studies. It is a really difficult job to say, why am I going to Florence, Italy to learn public speaking and interpersonal communication? Because that's all I'm allowed to teach is what's in my discipline. And so what Wixa says is, yeah, you're drawing students in for these sort of gen ed courses, but you've got to tailor these courses in a way that makes students make those connections. And that was the difficulty for me was to try to figure out how to do that. So um, I taught these two classes, and the first thing I did with my public speaking class was I tried to figure out how I could get students engaged in the environment that they were in. So they delivered four speeches, two of which were really based on research, and they had to connect with their audience. So for the informative speeches, I had them choose some aspect of Italy that they could inform and educate their audience about, something the audience didn't already know and would, hadn't learned already. And I'm telling you, when you challenge students to do something, they will take that ball and run with it. I was so impressed. I heard a speech on the production and grading of olive oil. No idea what's a virgin olive oil, an extra virgin. I learned all about that. And, and uh, the social impact of soccer in Italy, just how socially important soccer is. Like, you know, it's not just a sport, it's a way of life. Um, the history, design, and production of Venetian masks. I had a student went to Venice and she brought back a couple of Venetian masks and she talked about how they were made. Um, the historical significance of all the piazzas in Italy. That's where all the politicians gathered and talked and got you fired up about all the issues of the day and depending on which piazza you went to was which you know, speaker you could listen to and that's kind of their, their social networking of the day and that's how they framed it. You know, they're like, hey, we all get on Facebook, but piazzas were the Facebook of you know, ancient Florence and ancient Italy and I was like, wow, you know, to make that connection is really great. Um, I had a student talk about an interactive video game that featured historical figures from Florence that they created. Um, another one, the history of the oldest bridge, the Ponte Vecchio. And then I had students do persuasive speeches, and I said, okay, pick topics, pick issues that are important to the Italian culture or politics or any of those things, and I'm telling you, students didn't disappoint me. I heard a great speech on all the immigration problems in Italy. If you've been following any of the you know, politics in the United States, you think we're the only country in the world that has immigration problems. No, Italy is just, I mean, they are awash in immigration problems, and they don't know how to deal with it any more than sort of we do. They can't build a wall, you know, because they're getting them from all around, you know, uh, the, their shores. Um, water pollution in Italy, horrible, horrible. I mean, com companies, all they've done is just dump waste into the rivers, and Italy hasn't done anything about it. I never knew that, and I learned so much about that. Um, uh, Italy is on the verge of abandoning the euro. They want to go back to the lira because they're really upset with how fragile the European Union is and that currency is. And so I never knew that and learned all about you know, just the impact of why the euro is so, you know, why many people think the euro is bad for Italy. Um, the overcrowding of Venice's Grand Canal. You can't bring a car into Venice, so there's all of these boats and things and all of these tourist traps and things to the point where people can't get around in Venice anymore. Um, the last group of people in Italy to get any sort of real strong civil rights are women and gays and lesbians. It's a Catholic country. And so the whole notion of where Italy is in terms of these rights was really a powerful uh, lesson. And I took my, I also taught interpersonal communication. I had students write reflection papers on social norms. We talk a lot about ethnocentrism. The interesting thing, when I used to take students on speech and debate trips, we'd be there for six or seven days and eat at restaurants, and all my students did was complain about how poor the service was. How they would get in, if their food wasn't on the table in 10 minutes, you know, oh, horrible. You know, how do they treat their customers this way? And I kept trying to say, you're seeing the world through this sort of westernized version of, you know, that everything you know, in and out in 45 minutes or you know, no tip kind of thing, right? And so um, being in this 
three months, I had students start to realize, oh, wait a minute, this is how dinner is. And they're, they're shifting perspectives from this sort of ethnocentric perspective as, uh, wait a minute, in Italy, this is how we eat. You know, um, building friendships. They took a third course called Italian Life and Culture, so they learned a little bit of conversational Italian. Uh, um, in full disclosure, I tried to take this class and uh, couldn't do it because uh, I have really no aptitude for learning Italian. And we only learned it once a week, and then you left, and you came back a week later, and she expected us to know it all, and, and I couldn't do it. But they took it, and they loved their tour guide. They thought she was amazing, and I, walk, I went with her on a couple of uh, her excursions to uh, some of the... Um, uh, museums and galleries and uh, just absolutely breathtaking how much knowledge she had and how much they learned. And again, drawing these connections for these students. Students are saying, God, okay, I'm in Florence, but yeah, here's why I'm in Florence. This is all the stuff that I really want to learn. Um, so the other thing that uh, uh, the AIFS did was they also said, look, Florence is one sort of microcosm of society in Italy. If you see Florence as just kind of your own impression of what Italy is like, and if you've been to Florence, one of the things you'll notice is there's very little green space. It's covered in concrete, so much so that it's a lot of pollution, a lot of ways that people um, sort of uh, they'll take their dogs out and let them sort of pee and do whatever in the street and they don't get cleaned up and my students were just sort of appalled by all of this and their impression then sort of of Italy was this oh, it's kind of dirty and and you know and even though it's beautiful it still has this undertone of kind of you know not really as clean as they'd like and so AIFS said wait a minute okay before you escape Florence because you think oh it's just too much no green space and no parks or any of these you know few little parks here and there um, let's show you some other aspects.